Good to have you here. Joy. Where does that joy come from? It comes from the Lord, but how does the Lord give that joy when we're in obedience to his will? There is such joy in obedience, isn't there? When you're in disobedience, you know how you feel, right? You feel like whale dung at the bottom of the sea, you know? But boy, when you're in obedience, there's such a joy in your heart, isn't there? Yeah. So these last few weeks, we've been looking at what now? Yeah, what you say, the work, and the, person, the work and the person of the Holy Spirit. We began this because we were in John 16, where Jesus is talking to his disciples, saying, it's to your advantage, it's well to your advantage that I go away. For if I go away, I will send another, one of the same kind. I'll send my helper. He'll send the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, right, the Spirit of God. Now, the advantage is that the Spirit of God could be everywhere at once, can he? Because he's God. So he carries all the attributes of God. Jesus in his incarnation was limited. He could be in only one geographical location at a time, couldn't he? And very few people were able to enter into the joy and what was taking place at that time. But now, now that Jesus has ascended unto the Father and he has given to us the Holy Spirit, now the Spirit can be everywhere at once that wherever we are, he is, right? I'll never leave you nor forsake you, I will be with you even unto the end of the age. Isn't that wonderful? And there's some exciting things happening, aren't there? Concerning things for sure, for sure, for certain, especially for those who we love who do not believe. But they're exciting at the same time because we're approaching a time that the Bible speaks more of than any other. The Bible speaks of the first coming of Jesus, doesn't it? Significantly. But the Bible also speaks of the second coming of Jesus. Do you know how many more times the Bible speaks of the second coming than the first coming? Hmm? Three? No, about nine times as many. Nine times more does the Bible speak of the second coming of Jesus than it does the first coming. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? In the New Testament alone, one in ten verses speak of his second coming either implicitly or explicitly. Jesus is coming again. You believe that, don't you? Amen. And is he coming for you? I know he's coming for me. And how do we know that? Because we placed him first in our heart. It's not your performance. You can't perform perfectly, can you? Oh, I can tell you that even this week, you know, I didn't really represent the fruit of the Spirit in every occasion. <laughs> <What are you laughing? laughs> I'm, I'm sure I <laughs> okay <laughs> oh my dear <laughs> and whole ah, right we are amen nailed to the cross it's forgotten <laughs> yeah one day one day we'll actually be in the ab actual state of righteousness right Just, justification means that you declared Righteous. Sanctification means you're progressively becoming. But glorification means you'll actually be in the state of. Oh, that'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. But nonetheless, we're talking about the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we talked about the way in which the Spirit works in the life of the believer. First, there's that para experience where he comes alongside. And you would have never opened up your mind, your heart, your life in surrendering to Jesus had he not drawn you through that power experience of the Holy Spirit, right? We saw that likened unto the ministry of Jesus to those whom he loved, to his apostles for almost three and a half years. And then the next work of the Holy Spirit is described in that Greek preposition N-E-N, -E like the English word I-N, where Jesus there in John chapter 20, I believe it is, before he was ascended unto the Father on the first day of the resurrection, breathed out the Holy Spirit unto the disciples, the, holy, the uh, apostles of Jesus Christ. That's the inexperience. Now, the purpose of the inexperience was to do what? To produce what? How many were here the last couple of weeks? <laughs> the purpose of the inexperience of the Spirit is to begin to produce that fruit of the Holy Spirit that God wants to produce in your life. You can't produce it. I can't produce it. My love would never be sufficient. My love is a selfish love, isn't it? My love is a love that wants to take, not to give. I want to receive. But the Lord says, no, His love is more blessed to give then receive and so all of those fruits of the spirit can be demonstrated the potential every one of us have can be demonstrated as we yield to the work of the holy spirit who is in us the fruit of the spirit that we become who he says we are right if you're a christian be one 
How do we be one? By our own efforts, our own work, our own determination? Never. Nay. But by yielding to the Holy Spirit and allow him to live his life through us. Right? Now, now the next work of the Holy Spirit, when it's not the para, it's not the in, it's the epi, epi, where Jesus said to his disciples, even after he breathed upon them and they received the Holy Spirit, he said, now, now I'm going to be leaving, but you wait, you tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power, dunamis from on high. That epi, excuse me, that epi experience. Now, the epi experience of that empowerment from on high, what is that for? It, it's, it's manifested in gifts of the Spirit, in charismata, right? But what is that for? For the work of the ministry. That's right. It's the equipping. It's the equipping for ministry where you get the tools, you get the weapons, you get the ability to perform the ministry that God has for you. Has God got ministry for you? Yes. yes he has ministry for every one of us. Make no mistake about that. So this morning we want to begin our study on the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, where would you find a teaching with regard to the gifts of the Spirit? Where? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Where else? Where? Uh, four, 14 also talks about the use of tongues and the inappropriate use of tongues. We'll, we'll get to that. So 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the gifts of the Spirit, describing them. Not all of them. It's not all inclusive. Oh, Lord, I recognize I'm on a fool's errand. How could I possibly explain something so mysterious as the way in which your spirit works, Lord? I have experienced it, and so much of it, Lord, I, I still don't understand. But I'm so thankful for it, Lord. And so we're going to try this morning to attempt to describe how the Holy Spirit works in the life of the believer, equipping them for ministry with the various equippings that take place. But recognize that any list of the gifts of the Spirit, whether it's found in Romans 12 or 1 Corinthians 12 or Ephesians 4 or 1 Peter, that's not all inclusive. Make no mistake about it. Any charismata, any, any charisma that comes upon you where the Holy Spirit is working through you can be classified as a gift of the Spirit. Me being here this morning is a gift of the Spirit. Speaking to you, you showing up this morning is a gift of the Spirit. The inspiration of the Spirit brought you here, right? So that's a charismata, right? But if we were going to take a look and study through the gifts as we know it, we are completely dependent upon the writings of Paul. Correct? Pauline writings declare to us what this mystery is in the way in which the Spirit works to equip the believer for ministry. So we're going to go to chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians first. Let's go there. As you're turning, you don't mind if I pray again, do you? Lord, I recognize it is a fool's errand, Lord, for me to try to describe what's undescribable. As Pastor David was saying, as Jonathan, uh, John Michael in the beginning of the announcements, Lord, you how could we really understand your grace? How could any of us really fathom your love for us, Lord? So wide, so deep, so vast, so all-encompassing. And the work of your Holy Spirit, Lord, the mysteries. You said it's as the wind, you know, not from where it came nor where it's going, but we see it's his effect, his effect, Lord, not its, his. So this morning, Lord, as we try to understand these mysteries where blind men groping in the dark <laughs> and so help us Lord illuminate us give us revelation give us understanding but most importantly Lord at the end of this service may our hearts and our lives be more yielded to you more surrendered than we've ever been before to allow the work of your Holy Spirit to come forth in our life especially to those closest to us but those near and far Lord we want you to give us a gift to be able to share the gospel. Give us that gift to be able to disciple one another. Give us that gift to show compassion and love and mercy, Lord. As only your church can, Lord. Especially in these very difficult and dark days. We pray for the people of Ukraine, Lord. It truly breaks our hearts, so it's grievous to see once again what's taking place. We thought that we, it all ended after World War II, but the brutality and the savageness of man will always be with us until you, Prince of Peace, Shah Shalom, until you come and establish your kingdom. Hmm. So Lord, we pray, Lord Jesus, Maranatha, come quickly. But this morning, Holy Spirit, be our tutor, be our teacher. 
Open our mind, open our hearts, open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear all that you have for us this morning through this study of your word. In your holy name, amen. Everyone said amen. Amen. Chapter 12 is where Paul uh, begins to talk about spiritual gifts. Now, the problem in the Corinthian church was there was a manifestation of spiritual gifts, but most of it was done in a very immature way. You know, the purpose of the spiritual gifts that God brings is to bring unity to the body of Christ in the diversity of gifts and the diversity of the temperaments that we have and personality, talents, etc. And then through all of that, let's be exercised, this unity and this diversity that we display in maturity, right? It should bring us to maturity, not to division. The gifts were never given for anyone to parade them around as a badge of pride spiritual pride or superiority but the gifts are given for the benefit of all so that we all come to the unity of the faith to the perfect man Christ likeness to the maturity that God wants to bring us to and it doesn't matter whether we're studying through Romans chapter 12 or 1 Corinthians here chapter 12 or even Ephesians that's the way Paul's mind presents it as he inspired by the Holy Spirit in Romans 12 the first five verses talk about unity as here in 1 Corinthians the first 13 verses are going to talk about the unity that happens as a result of the spirit. In chapter 4 of Ephesians 1 through 6 he talks about maintaining not creating we don't have to create unity do we? No 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 all we have to do is maintain the unity that we already have in the person of the Holy Spirit he's the one who makes us one makes us one with the father with Christ and makes us one with another right? Our unity should be in the spirit and we were talking about that a little bit yesterday at the conference where we declare that we insist upon unity where? In the essentials of the faith. No, there are times when we can argue about what's essential, right? <laughs> but in the non-essentials, so your understanding of biblical prophecy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we can allow for diversity, liberty in diversity, right? What's the term University. Unity and diversity, that's where it comes from. University, unity and diversity. But in all of that, all of that, we demand unity on the essentials, liberty on the non-essentials, but in all things, charity or love. Love, absolutely. So that's where that maturity comes in. So whether you're talking about here in 1 Corinthians or in Romans 12 or even in Ephesians 4, that's how Paul lays it out. The purpose of these gifts for the Holy Spirit is to bring unity and to display the diversity and the diverse gifts and working and exercising of the work of the ministry and for the purposes of bringing us to maturity, to Christ's likeness. Nobody has the same, we don't all have the same gifts, do we? And he's going to go on to describe that, the diversity. But here he talks about unity first in the first 13 verses here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, uh, spiritual gifts, that's uh, from two Greek words, charis, which means grace, charis, grace, pneuma, spirit. It's a charisma pneumatikon, which is a singular spiritual gift, or charismata pneumatikon which is spiritual gifts, plural, okay? But that's what he's going to be talking about now. He wants you to understand this mystery of the way in which the Spirit empowers you for the work of ministry that he's called you to. Now concerning these spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Or did he say, I do not want you ignorant, brethren? I'm not sure. What is it? <laughs> Boy, do we have a lot of ignorant brethren today, don't we? Why? Because unfortunately, most churches aren't doing exactly what they've been called to do in Ephesians, which is to prepare the saints for the work of the ministry. So we all come to that unity, that maturity, that Christ likeness that we're talking about. Unfortunately, most churches aren't teaching today. They're just a pep rally. We're going to get all excited emotionally. But he says here, I do not want you ignorant, brother, with regard to these things. Verse 2, you know that you were Gentiles carried away by those dumb idols, right? <laughs> What were some of those idols that people get carried away by now? However, you were led? Money, money. Wait, what do, what do we say? What percentage of the church tithes today? Two. Interesting statistic. I read the same statistic that Nathan mentioned to me this morning. That, you know, that 2% of Christian parents, now we're not talking about non Christians, we're talking about those who say they're believers. 2% of Christian parents believe what? Have a biblical worldview. That's the latest statistic that's out there. Two percent of Christian parents have a biblical worldview that they share with their children. They're probably the same two percent that what? <laughs> <laughs> Dumb idols. Yeah, money, materialism. What other idols are there? 
power, power, position, you want your, your ego gets out of control. Your power, your position could be pleasures, right? Whatever that pleasure may be. We said possessions. It could be a, a number of things that we place before the Lord. That's an idol. And anything, anything that takes precedence in your heart above the Lord is an idol, right? I'm sorry? Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah, and then they grew up to be monsters. <laughs> we won't talk there. We're not going to go there. Verse 3, therefore I make known to you that no one, no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. That's for sure, right? Yeah, you even get upset when you hear his name used in vain, don't you? Yeah. No one will call Jesus a curse if they have the Spirit, and no one, no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? That you're all charismatics. Now, we know that Gail's a charismatic, don't we? All you have to, <laughs> all you have to do is watch her during worship, and you know that the Lord's working in her life, and the Holy Spirit just comes forth, and I think that's true of uh, several of you. But every Christian, every Christian is truly a charismatic, even John MacArthur, believe it or not. <laughs> And I love, I love John MacArthur, don't make no mistake, so I say that tongue-in-cheek. But there are those who are cessationists. And what's a cessationist? They believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased. Well, just because I can't understand it all, I, I, I can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I can't say it doesn't exist. There's a lot of mysteries in the scriptures that I can't understand, but you know what? I believe in my heart. Isn't that not true? Yeah, and, and the spiritual gifts and the way in which the spirit works, one of those things. But, but they're cessationists nonetheless, and they think that well, as we get into chapter, I think we talked about this last time we were together last week, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. They said when that which is come, when that which is perfect has come, then that which is uh, inferior is done away with. They believe that that is the coming of the New Testament, and with the coming of the New Testament, the sign gifts have ceased. That's not so. It's not talking about sign gifts at all. What's it talking about? That predominant... Belief in the New Testament that speaks one of every ten verses. What is it talking about? What's coming? Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, of course. Not the, not the Bible, not the New Testament, the canon of Scripture complete. And so everyone who confesses the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord, Savior, is got a spiritual gift. And that only comes by the Holy Spirit. For by grace you've been saved through faith. Not of works, this any man should both. A gift of God, right? So who's the charismatic? All of us, all of us, even the Presbyterians, the frozen chosen, they're charismatic, <laughs> whether they know it or not. Verse four, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works in all. Is that true? Yeah. One faith, one Lord, one baptism, right? One church, one body of Christ. We're all one body, but there's a diversity of the gifts, as he's saying here. And we see the work of the Trinity here. Diversity of gifts by the Spirit, diversity of ministries by the Lord, diversity of activities by God himself. Speaking of, of the God, of the triune God who's working in all these things to bring that unity and that Christ-likeness and that maturity that should take place in his church, among his family. Nothing more distressing than family division. Isn't that true? When families turn on one another, when they divide one another, when they devour one another, it's not, nothing, nothing more upsetting for parents when you see your children fighting one another. True of God, too. Nothing more upsetting for him than he sees us fighting one another. Now, it doesn't mean we all have to agree on every point. Isn't that true? On the essentials, we agree. But on the non-essentials, we can disagree. And we can have fun doing it. And, and our discussions should create a lot of light and very little heat. Right? <laughs> uh, started to get into one of those yesterday. <coughs> For to one is given the Logosophia, the word of wisdom. Now, what is the word of wisdom? Anybody know what the word of wisdom is gifted for? It goes along with another. Now, again, please understand that, you know, it's very hard to be dogmatic and, and extremely technical on all of the definition of these gifts, okay? Uh, the word of wisdom blends with another gift that's given. There are two are almost synonymous. Uh, it's called the gift of evangelization or evangelism. So why would the word of wisdom be coupled with the, with the gift of evangelism? 
knowing his word, but knowing the gospel and being able to herald the caruso. That's the word in the Greek text, to herald the gospel, be a caruso, to be able to share the gospel with people. The wisdom of being able to understand, to know, and to share the mysteries of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we live in a very broken world, don't we? And we are all very broken people. Is that not true? Yeah. But God in his love, for God so loved that he gave his only son. That was the remedy for the brokenness in our world. That's the remedy, the bomb, the healing salve for the brokenness in each of our lives. And how broken the world is today, isn't it? How much we are in need of him to come and heal us of our brokenness. Individually, the family, our families, collectively as a world. Mm. So this uh, Sophia is a Greek word for wisdom. If you know somebody named Sophia or your daughter's name is Sophia, it's a beautiful name. Logos Sophia, the word of wisdom. Word of wisdom given so that you can exercise that wisdom through the power of the Holy Spirit and bringing about salvation in opening, used, being used of God and opening a mind and a heart to the truth of who Jesus is. Hmm? So to one is given a word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another, a word of knowledge through the same Spirit. So what would we say the difference is between the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge or logos gnosis? How to, that's very good. Yes, how to apply it. So if we're applying the word of wisdom in evangelistic efforts to bring people to an awareness of who Jesus really is, and that can only happen through the Holy Spirit, right? What is the unpardonable sin? Blasphemy. Rejection of the witness of the Holy Spirit with regard to the person of Jesus Christ in his activity in saving the truth of the gospel. Now, if word of wisdom is used for evangelistic purposes, where do you think that this uh, word of knowledge or teaching would be used? I gave it away. <laughs> teaching. You evangelize and then you disciple. Disciple. Discipleship. Now, one of the greatest needs in the church today, and we talked about that last week, the need is love, love of the Spirit to be expressed, right? We talked about the sermon. There's a tremendous need for discernment in the church. It doesn't seem to have much. You know, as I said, that the largest church in Georgia, the pastor got up and said, Christianity is not based upon 66 ancient documents. It's based upon your experience with Jesus today. What should everyone in that church have done had they had discernment? Run out with their hair on fire. <laughs> because if you're going to base your understanding of theology and salvation proper and et cetera, et cetera, based upon what you think, we're going to have a variety of opinions, and they're all not all going to agree for sure, and most are going to be wrong. If you need to be orthodox in your doctrine, in your understanding, in your teaching, that's what doctrine is, your teaching, then you need to get that understanding from those 66 ancient documents. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. But such a lack of discernment, such a lack of discipleship in the church today. I wonder why there's so many, so many who are afraid to disciple their flock, to grow them strong in the Word of God. I'm sorry? Cultural pressures. Yeah. I'm sorry? They would lose a lot of people if they taught the truth of God's word, wouldn't they? Yeah. It's not popular at all, no. But when, when, is, when has the truth of God's word ever been popular? Hmm? It's always been anti-cultural, you know, against the culture. So he talks about the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge by the same spirit. And to another faith. Business, what's this? Faith. It's a justifying faith. It's a trusting faith. It's a convincing faith. It's a faith that knows. Just you know that you know that you know that everything that God said is true and what he has accomplished is in fact true and what he's going to do in the future is yet true. And who gives you that faith? The Holy Spirit. It's a grace gift of faith, right? For by grace you have been saved through faith. The grace gift that God has mounted to us, faith, but just to believe, to know all of this is true. Now, as we are growing in our understanding, as the discipleship is taking place through that exercise of the word of knowledge, we come to a greater and greater understanding of the faith that we have. We stand on a mountain of evidence that what we believe is true, but yet there are those mysteries that you can only believe by Faith, faith. That's what we're talking about here. That's that faith. 
that you have faith in God, confidence in God, trust in God's word, even when you may not be able to understand it completely. So verse 9, to another, faith by the same spirit. And to another, gifts of healing. Oh boy, we like that gift, don't we? The word healing in the Greek text, you've heard me say it many times. Iyama. Iyama is, means to cure. It's to heal. And the grace gift of healing, charisma, grace gift from the Holy Spirit, charisma, iyama, the gift to heal. Now, Jesus healed. Jesus, the God healed in the Old Testament. He healed throughout the life of Christ. He healed in the New Testament, in the history of the early church. He heals today, doesn't he? Doesn't he? But there is a great healing that will occur for every one of us, won't there be? Hmm? Where all of our brokenness will be healed. Every wrong will be made right. Every wound will be healed, self-inflicted or otherwise. Isn't that wonderful? But today, today we still pray because we're commanded to, when there are any sick among us, we lay hands upon them, we pray the prayer of faith, and, and the fervent prayer of the righteous will avail us much in that they will be healed. Now, does it always happen that way? No. Is, is, the, is the healing dependent upon the individual or upon God? God. God gives the gift of healing. And he gives the gift of healing, as I understand it, as I read the scriptures and my understanding in reading about healings and experiencing healings I have witnessed and been a party to, it is dependent upon God. Every single individual case is different, and you pray. God, your will be done, and if you desire to me to have this gift to heal, then, Lord, we pray that you would heal. And that's why we, whenever we pray for someone for healing, we have the multitude come forward to pray. It's no one individual should ever get the credit for healing. Who heals? It's God. Who's the most uh, prolific, I guess, or popular? <clears throat> I didn't even ask the question yet. <laughs> you already gave me the answer. Faith healer. Benny with the Hindu. His, his Hindu isn't so good anymore. He's losing his hair like I am. But Benny the Hindu. You know, Benny Hinn, there's not one medically verifiable, scientifically documented healing that he's ever performed. Did you know that? If he truly was the faith healer that he claims to be, then someone would take him to the hospital in every major city and free all these people of their afflictions, right? But does Jesus heal? Yes, yes. And, and so we, we don't negate the fact that uh, even in the gift of modern medicine, and God has given us so many advances in modern medicine and surgical techniques that improve the quantity and quality of our life, right? Isn't that a gift? Yeah, God gave them that gift of wisdom, but at the same time, God does heal supernaturally today. I've been a party to those supernatural healings, and I know of many who have been healed by God, and particularly in the third world where they don't have all of those advantages and the medical care that we get today. So the gift of healing is bonafiably true. It actually does take place. But one day, one day, the greatest healing will take place where we're all made righteous, mm -hmm. completely whole. Holy, H-O-L-Y, right? And whole, W-H-O-L-E. Isn't that wonderful? Looking forward to that day? Amen. You? Mm -hmm. Gifts of healing. And any gift that Jesus gave, in the, even in the New Testament, every individual that he healed, would eventually happen to them? They died. They died. So any healing that you may receive here in this life is temporary, right? But the greater healing will be eternal. The charisma, the same spirit, yeah, verse 10. And the working of miracles. This word uh, miracles speaks of divine power. What is that word in the Greek to talk about divine power? Deutimus, the deutimus, dynamite power. That's where we get the word dynamite. The deutimus power, the working of miracles, where God gives you the faith to believe, right? Maybe it's a word of knowledge. Maybe it's a, a, the gift of faith to perform a miracle, something that is supernaturally uh, can't can be explained in the natural. It is supernatural. It goes beyond our, our pragmatic mind and our experience and what we know of science, but yet it's a miracle. So God does perform miracles. Have you ever witnessed any miracles? Anybody have a testimony? Go ahead, and I want to hear it. No way that should have happened, right? Yeah. You know, I love uh, going and rehearsing all of the stories of Israel and the miracles that were performed by God, supernatural deeds, activities of God during the 48 war, the 67 war, the 73 war, a multitude of miracles. Today, today, right now, the Ukrainians are claiming a number of supernatural events that have occurred in, in protecting some of those folks there. 
Amazing. The working of miracles or divine power always for the sake of others and for the glory of God. And most often it'll happen to bring one's attention so that that gift of the word of wisdom can be exercised. What's that now? Sharing the gospel, the good news, right? Now, the miracles that Jesus performed, and he performed many miracles, didn't he, during his earthly ministry, always were followed up by what? The proclamation of the gospel, the truth, the way to be saved. The miracles were used to get the attention, to grab the attention of the people for the sake of sharing with them the true miracle that would take place in the transformation of every heart and every life. Hmm? It's this gift of miracles. And to another, prophetia or prophecy. Now this word prophecy, it's inspired speech. And it's not so much the forth telling as it was in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament when the Holy Spirit came upon individuals, and there were many, in ecstasy, they would foretell, right? Or foretell, foretell the future, correct? Can you think of some examples? Daniel? Daniel? Yeah, Daniel took us right to our present day and beyond. He takes us to the end of the age. So there were many prophets in the Old Testament who would foretell the future. But here, Paul understands this gift, this prophetia, as the foretelling. The foretelling of what? The Word of God. The Word of God. Being able to look at chapter 14 for a minute. Go there for a second. Let me see. Speaking of the gift of tongues and the abuses that were taking place in the church at Corinth in chapter 14, he talks about the fact that he wished they all sp spoke in tongues, sure, but that they would prophesy even more so. Uh, let's see. No, somebody see it before I do? One, two, three, four, six. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. What does he do? He does not speak to men. To, so if you're, if you're speaking in tongues, who benefits from that gift? Yourself. As we understand it today. Self. So every other spiritual gift is for the benefit of the body, for everyone else. This is the only gift that's given for the benefit of the individual. And Paul said he would rather speak five words in a known language than 10,000 words in a tongue in the language of angels. Why? Because nobody would be benefited by it, right? How many of you speak in tongues? Nobody here? Yeah. I sing in tongues. <laughs> but it, I don't know what I'm saying. It bypasses my intellect. I have no idea what I'm saying, but I know that the Spirit is praying through me. Now, I only do it in my prayer, prayer time. Have any of you heard me sing or pray in tongues? No. You might have. <laughs> You're the only one. But, uh, but when I do, I recognize I'm trusting God. I'm bypassing my intellect, my pragmatism, and I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to, to speak, to pray through me, right? We know not what or how, but the Holy Spirit will give us that understanding. Now, is tongues for everyone? No. Where in, in line of priority, where is tongues? The least, the least of the gifts. The least. So why, unfortunately, is the Pentecostal church putting such emphasis upon it? Why? When it's the least. Because they're not exercising it appropriately, much like the church of Corinth, much like Paul had to exhort and rebuke the church here. But if he prophesies, prophetia, the telling forth of the word of God, forth telling, verse 3, he speaks edification and exhortation and comfort. So when we exercise this gift of prophecy, prophetia, where we're forth telling the word of God, it should always result in the individual being exhorted with exhortation. We're going to talk about the gift of exhortation in a minute. Encouragement. What else is exhortation? Build up, that's encouragement. Correction, a warning. You, you can also exhort in a word of warning, right? Exhortation, edification. Edification is building up, right? But all of it should bring us to comfort in knowing the word of God and knowing the ways of God. Is God the same yesterday, today, and forever? God's forgiveness and grace and mercy upon you will be now and forever, right? It will not change. 
Hmm? And so that's this gift of prophecy as Paul understood it. Uh, let me go back to tongues. Did I speak about tongues? We didn't speak about tongues yet. Let's go back to chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. The discerning of spirits. And what is that? Test the spirits. That's what John tells us in his first Johannine epistle. Beloved, test the spirits. Not everyone's from God. Are there supernatural phenomena that take place that cannot be explained that is not of God? Yes. Sure, sure. Can you give me an example from the New Testament? The daughter of divination in Philippi, the demon-possessed girl. Remember? Was she speaking the truth? Was she speaking the truth? Yeah, she was speaking the truth, but she wasn't doing it by the Spirit of God. It was the Spirit of Satan. Satan is a deceiver. It's amazing, and uh, yeah, I'll go here for a moment. I said I would. Last week I mentioned that Pastor David is very careful in his song selection. He omits any songs from Bethel, Elevation, Hillsong. Why do we eliminate any songs from those three movements? Because they're heretical and we'd be supporting heresy. Now, some of the songs are wonderful. They're beautiful. They can bring you to tears. But who was the first worship leader? Lucifer. Lucifer. And, and what leads so many people astray, particularly young people astray today? Music. The, the music becomes the allure of the Pied Piper, right? The Pied Piper got the rats all to drown themselves in the river. Why? Through his serenading, through his music. Now, some of those songs are beautiful songs, but you're paying royalties to that organization which is doctrinally incorrect, leading many astray. And my prayer this morning is that God would expose these hucksters, these charlatans, you know, Johnson and Furtick and the rest of them who are merchandising the things of God for the sake of their own popularity, prominence, position. It's a cult. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. No, make no mistake about it. So you've got to be very, very careful, and especially with this powerful gift of music, right? Mm. I mentioned the most popular female Christian artist in the country today, Lauren Daigle. She's not a Christian. You can't be a Christian and believe in Eastern mysticism, transcendental meditation. You can't be a Christian and say you don't have a position on, on gender dysphoria and homosexual and lesbianism. You, you can't be. Now, who's, who's her pastor? Andy Stanley. Well, that's the guy that said you've got to disconnect. You've got to unhitch the Old Testament from the New. And now he's gotten far worse. That was a couple years ago. Now he's gotten far worse. Now he's saying you've got to ignore both, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and let your experience determine what you believe. Hmm. It's not the Logos. It's not the Word. It's the Rhema. Isn't that what the Pentecostals say? It's their experience now that supersedes the Word. Is that new? Is there anything new about that? No, I grew up in Romanism, a Roman Catholic. If the Pope would speak from the seat that he sits upon where he becomes Christ on earth, they don't mean he's rep his representative. They mean that, that mystically, magically, the Pope actually becomes Christ on earth. And when he speaks ex cathedra, it is the words of God. And if it's counter to the word of God, if it contradicts the word of God in any way, it's a new revelation from God. Would that be true? Of course not. But that's how they gained control over the people, didn't they? You know, in history, there were as many as three popes all claiming to be pope at the same time. Who's right? <laughs> no, it's ridiculous. And so, so the hyper-Pentecostalism of today, which says that you have to embrace and believe the rhema if it goes above and beyond the logos, is no different than what the Catholics believe when the pope spoke ex cathedra, right? When he pontificated. <laughs> Why did we go there? Uh, Prophecy, prophetia. The discerning of spirits, right? The discerning of spirits is that you make sure that you understand that what's being shared is from the Word of God, that it aligns with God's Word. I, uh, I mentioned to you uh, the chosen as a form of just entertainment, right? Enjoying uh, being amused through that production. When I first started watching it without getting into the history behind it at all, and the, and the producer, director, and all of the other thing, I started to enjoy it very much until I started to compare what they were sharing on the screen to the scriptures. And th they were incompatible, extra-biblical. 
you know, I remember when the Passion of the Christ first came out, and I didn't see the movie, I haven't seen it to this day, but I understood the spirit that was behind the movie. The spirit that was behind the movie, was it the Holy Spirit? Some of you don't know, do you? No. You think it was the Holy Spirit? Test the spirits and see. Okay, so you've got to go back to who produced the movie. Who was it? Certainly an example of Christianity for all the world to see, right? Is he? No. Shortly after the production of the movie, he got caught uh, drunk, and he went into this drunken tirade about what? Anti-Semitism. Hatred of the Jews. That's not the Spirit of God. Well, nonetheless, he produced the, the movie, right? He produced the film. What was the reason for him producing the film? What? He was making penance. He was doing penance. He knows he's a sinful man. He knows he's a wretch, right? I mean, we, we all knew we were sinners. We all know we still sin, but we're forgiven now, thankfully, saved by grace. But he did it as an act of penance. He didn't know if he'd make any money or not, but he used his own money to produce the film. And by the way, he is a very strong Catholic, right? He embraced Vatican II, but nonetheless, there's not much difference between Vatican I and Vatican II, what the church believes, and so he would have a priest on site of production of the film every single day performing the Mass, the Mass, the miracle of the Eucharist. Is, is that truly of God? No, not at all. Not at all. It's a cup of uh, the early church and the Reformed church believed that that was the cup of what? Demons. That Paul talks about in Corinthians. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. And so they saw that as the cup of demons, that you're re-crucifying Christ over and over and over and over again, performing this Eucharistic miracle. But that's what he would do on the production of the site every single day. What was the inspiration for everything that he produced in the film that was extra biblical? It was, it was, he read this book called The Dolores Passions of the Christ, produced by a witch, a 17th century nun who said she could levitate, that she could bilocate, she could be in two places in history at the same time, that she was where she was in Europe in the 17th century, and that she was actually there at the crucifixion of Christ. Is that possible? No, where's that come from? So when you look at all of these facts, you discern that this is not the Lord. Could it be? Satan? <laughs> and we look back on it now, and we know that's exactly what it was, you know, because what it did do was when the Catholic Church was losing people by the hundreds because of the pedophilia that was taking place and the number of, of uh, accused priests who were found guilty, they had to do something to regain the flock. And so that's what Satan used, that movie, to re-energize Romanism. Amazing. Test the spirits and see. How about the prayer of Jabez? Did you get the prayer of Jabez toothpaste holder? Pajamas? <laughs> pillowcase? You didn't get that? No. What was the prayer of Jabez all about? <laughs> greed. It was all about greed. Increase my borders, Lord. You know, don't you know when you, when you come to Jesus, man, it's like hitting the lottery. You're the king's kids. Just name it and claim it. Rip it and glip, lip it and grip it. Blab it and grab it, you know? Did you ever hear any of that craziness? No? Not here you have it, no. <laughs> Kenneth Copeland, Dad Hagen, he started all this, you know. But that's what that is, you see. Yeah. You've got to test the beloved, especially now more than ever before, test the spirits. Because the enemy is far more cunning and diabolical today than he was in the past. Before it was so, it was so obvious. He's so insidious. So you've got to be very, very careful to be careful not to fall for the traps of the enemy. His schemes, his methodologies, his pitfalls, right? Discerning of spirits, so important. Life after death experiences. Numerous number of people have claimed to have life after death experiences, right? But how do you know if your experience is, is valid or not, if of the Lord or not? I'm sorry? You've got to bounce it off the Word of God. Every, everything that you experience in the supernatural that someone claims to be the Holy Spirit, you need to bounce that against the Word of God. Now, if it's contrary to the Word of God, throw it out immediately. God has given us the rev all the revelation that we need of his plans, his purposes, and his methods up until the time of Christ. Now, I think we'll be learning some new things once we go to heaven. But right now, he's given us everything that we need to know now for life and godliness in Christ Jesus. Test the spirits. And to another different kinds of glossa, 
or language or tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. These two can go together too, tongues and the interpretation of tongues. As we understand tongues in the first manifestation of it was where? Acts chapter on the day of? Right. So what was the purpose of the gift? Each of the apostles was given a tongue, a language, a known language on earth that they had no previous understanding of. And not only did they have that language, they would have that specific dialect that they would speak. That's what amazed all of these Jews who came from all over Asia, speaking different languages, different dialects within that language, and they said, how is it, how is it that we hear them in our language, in our dialectos, our dialect? Wow. So it's a known language on earth that they were speaking, unknown to the speaker, but completely understood by those who could hear, the hearers, right? So that was the first use of the gift of tongues. Now, we do understand from Paul's writing that it's also a gift of the language of angels. Though I have the tongue of men and of angels and have not, it profits me? Right. But you can exercise a gift of speaking the language of angels. That's why I said there are those who have that gift and exercise it in their private prayer time, right? And then they do that for their own self-edification. You ever have a bad day? You ever feel bummed out? You feel like you're food for demons rather than God's gift? Hmm? <laughs> Well, for me, one, all, all I need to do is just get into my prayer closet and then allow the Holy Spirit to begin to pray through me and to start to speak in tongues. And then next thing you know, I'm singing and my spirit is so lifted and I recognize, no, I'm not forsaken. I'm not abandoned. The Lord loves me. And then I go to the Word because it'll always drive me to the Word again. And the Word reaffirms everything for me. But Paul said, I would rather you speak five languages, in a, five words in a known language, then 10,000 words in a tongue. And I want you to take and use this gift in a very organized way that there should be, everything should be done decently and in order. And he said, so if anybody among you is going to speak in tongues, let him do so only if there's somebody who can interpret the language of angels. Is there anybody here interpret the language of angels? So, and Paul said, at the most, at the most, two, no more than three utterances and illiteracies. He said, it's far more, far more profitable for the body of Christ, for their edification, exhortation, and comfort to be built up in the Word of God. Now, it's, you know, we love the sensational, don't we? What people group on the face of the earth had experienced more miracles than the Jews coming out of Egypt? in that 40 years of wilderness wandering. There's none, is there? No people group on the face of the earth ever experienced more of the miraculous of God. And what happened with those folks? They died in doubt and unbelief. That entire generation had to wander in the wilderness of doubt and unbelief for 40 years. Miracles don't save you. Well, the, the miracle of grace gift does, but I mean, the sensational, the sign gifts do not save people. They're used to get their attention to bring them to an understanding of the gospel to where they will become saved. Hmm? Does that make sense to you? So there's the gift of tongues, glacialia. There's the interpretation of tongues. There is uh, verse 11, but one and the same spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually. What's it say? As who wills. Oh, this is determined upon God. God makes the determination who gets what gift. Wait a minute. What about all these seminars you can go to and learn how to speak in tongues? You ever been invited to one? I have. Yeah. They're going to meet at some hotel and the, the, the evangelist is going to come and he's going to teach you all how to speak in tongues. How can you teach somebody a spiritual gift? That's an impossibility. You can't. Either you have it and it's been given to you by God or you don't. Poor Billy Graham. Must not have been saved, huh? Poor Billy Graham. Poor Billy. He never had the gift of tongues. Did you know that? He prayed his entire life earnestly for the gift of tongues. And God never gave it to him. Poor Billy Graham. According to the hyper-Pentecostals, he's not saved. That the one, the one manifestation of the Spirit, salvation, is the gift of tongues. Is that true? If anybody says that to you, what should you tell them? Like, liar, liar, your pants are on fire. <laughs> it's, 
it's just not true because the Holy Spirit distributes the gifts as he wills according to his calling and purpose upon your life. The gifts are the equipping of the saint for the work of ministry. Whatever ministry God has called you to, you see. Yeah. For as the body is one and has many members, but all of the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now, we have uh, different members in our body, right? All have different functions, different colors, but it's still my body, isn't it? Someone asked me, why don't we have a membership here? I, 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 I don't have the ability to determine who's in his church and who isn't really. I can examine to see if you have any fruit in your life, and if there's an obvious abundance of the realization of fruit, then I can say, well, this person's saved. If there's an absence of fruit, the only thing I can conclude is, well, they, we need to talk about the cross. <laughs> we need to get you saved, right? But we don't have a membership here because only God really knows. But I will say this, this local body here at Community Chapel, we know who our fingers and hands are, don't we? You see, I know these are my ten fingers. I can look at your hands and say, no, they're not mine. I have no control over it. I can't move them, can I? But I know which fingers belong to me, to my body. The same thing is true, you know, as we gather together. We know who's been among us, who's rejoiced with us, who's weeped with us, who's shared with us. We know who we're in communion with. We know who the body of Christ is here. We don't need a membership, do we? There's no membership that you vote people into the body of Christ. That's the Holy Spirit's function, right? But he's talking about the fact that there's this diversity of, of uh, individuals or of gifts, but all for the purpose of uniting one body together in Christ. Verse 13, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. That's that N experience where it comes in you, whether Jew or Greek, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into that one spirit, right? The spirit of Christ. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not the body, is it therefore not the body? Of course not. If the ear should say, because I am not the eye, I am not the body, is it not therefore the body? Yeah. And if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were a hearing, where would the smelling be? Well, I lost a lot of my smelling after COVID. I had COVID in, when did we have it? December 2020? Yeah. I still haven't regained all my smell, which I did, and I really enjoyed smelling certain things. Gail's cookies, baking. Hmm. Do you realize that in every single cell of your body, you have all the engineering schematics to create another you perfectly? Do you know that? Every single cell in my body contains all the engineering data, right, to make another me perfectly. Yet, there are a variety or a diversity of cells in my body. What are some of the cells in my body? Skin cells. Hair cells. Need more, need more, Lord. I pray for hair cells, Lord. What other cells? Blood cells, right cells, white cells, red cells. What else? There's a multitude of a variety of cells in your body. Now, now how is it that your body was comprised the way it is so perfectly, so wonderfully, Right? fearfully and wonderfully made, and to, why am I not just one big nose up here? Or one big glop of hair? Or one big toenail? You know what? Because it's in function, but who determined? Hans, you love to play music, don't you? You played in the orchestra too, didn't you? Yeah. Now, if you could play every single instrument in the orchestra, and you could read proficiently off every sheet of music, and there were a thousand of you, how would we know who's to do what? You have all the instruments, you have all the music, but there's a thousand of you out there. What if you all decide you want to play the bass or the fiddle or the trombone? Who, did, who makes that determination? The orchestra conductor, the conductor, right? We have a great conductor here in, in uh, Greenville, by the way. But the conductor makes that determination. Who's the conductor that determines what each cell is going to be? As, as within you, the largest cell in a man is the sperm cell, the largest cell in a woman, the egg. They come together, they split, and they multiply, they divide, and multiply, divide, and multiply, divide, and multiply. And all of a sudden, it's a miracle of you. Who was directing that orchestra? God. That symphony of life. God. Isn't that amazing? Well, the same thing is true here with the body of Christ and the, and the spiritual gifts. He gives us the spiritual gifts as he wills, not according to what we want, but what we need for the 
purpose of unity and of Christ's likeness and of maturity. Do we all become the whole man, whole woman, right? Yeah. Verse 18, now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor can the head say to the feet, I have no need of you. Mm. I like it the way my, my mind tells my body to work. You know what my body says sometimes? No. Nope. <laughs> no, nope, we ain't doing that. <laughs> in disobedience, isn't it? Now, if I have a gift of uh, compassion and mercy, uh, you, you're praying for that for me. I know you are. If I, <laughs> if I had the gift of compassion and mercy, and I was so tender-hearted that, that even if you were antinomian, I couldn't exhort you over that. What does that mean to be antinomian? Paul addressed those problems of Judaizers and the opposite of the Judaizers were the Antinomians. Judaizers were those who believed they could win approval to God by the law. The Antinomians said, eat, drink, and be merry, do whatever you want because the body's evil and you don't have to obey any moral law. You can have a lost life and a saved soul. That's what that means. Is that true? No, 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 no. But, you know, if I have a great gift of compassion and mercy, I might be a little hesitant to say, you're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong right but it ta- listen it takes a certain degree of of calling and giftedness to call people out when they're wrong is that true yeah and, and it takes a certain degree of discernment the testing of the spirits now i have to tell you i lean strongly on that side I, I, I'm practicing, I'm learning. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm young yet, I'm only 70, but I'm, I'm learning how to exercise that gently and compassionately and tenderly so I don't destroy anybody. But, but that's my strength, okay? Now, your strength, my dear, is you're, you're just so loving, you're so compassionate, you're so merciful, you're so tenderhearted that you, you have such a difficult time telling somebody that they're wrong, don't you? Don't you? But I appreciate that giftedness you have. I pray that God would make me more like you. And do you pray that God would make you more like me? No, you don't. No, you don't. No. no. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, uh, please, don't make slight of somebody else's gift because it's not yours. We, we need one another. I am thankful for the Oswald Chambers of life. What would characterize Oswald Chambers? His heart. He was such a loving man. Everybody heard his heart beat, you know. But I'm equally thankful for the David Hunts of life. Who's David Hunt? A prolific writer with tremendous discernment warning the church, exhorting the church. Is one superior to the other? Do we not need them both? Yes, yes. None of us have it all together, but all together we have it all. That's, that's precisely what the apostle's saying here. So please, please, when you see somebody exercising their giftedness, even though it may not be yours and you may not even understand it, try not to be hypercritical of it. You know, it's not my gift, but it's certainly theirs. Now, when I say... Uh, the church's greatest need today is discernment. I'm not discounting those who are compassionate and loving and merciful. I'm not. But if, if, if in that compassion and mercy they're sharing false doctrine, heresy, well, that, then you have to address that. Equally so, as a person has got a discerning of spirits and he's got a great gift of discernment and, he, and he's just mean and harsh and cruel in the way he exercises it, well, that's got to be addressed too, doesn't it? Yeah. Make sense what I'm saying to you? Yeah. So respect one another and your giftedness, because we're not all the same, thank God. Verse 22. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have great modesty. But our presentable parts have no need, but God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. So give me an example of the body, the lesser part. That you give no honor to. 
Your big toe, okay? You had your big toe operated on Friday. You became aware of that big toe, didn't you? Whoa, Nelly. Hmm? Yeah. What are some of the less honorable parts of the body? How about the bowels? Your bowels? <laughs> your bladder? The less, the, 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 we call them the less organs and they're not. But God, we have voluntary muscles and we have involuntary muscles or organs in the body, right? The voluntary ones are the ones that God gives you control over, right? Like your feet, your hands, your mouth. <laughs> we, we wish God would take control of our mouth sometimes, don't we? I know I do. <laughs> but the involuntary muscles or organs of the body, what are some of those that God takes control over? Your heart, your lungs, you know. Decide to hold your breath and not breathe. I'm so mad, I'm not breathing again. What's going to happen? <gasps> You're going to breathe, right? Now, basically, he's saying that too. You know, we need to understand that there are those uh, presentable parts of the body that everybody sees. You know, I guess I'm one of those, right? But, but that's a lesser part of the body. You know what's a greater part of the body than the gift I'm exercising right now? That seems to go without honor intercessory intercessory Prayer. come on intercessory Prayer. yeah what's what's that what's about what's with that do you know how much more would get accomplished if we were all truly the prayer warriors that god asks us to be allowing him the freedom to do all that he desires to do. That's what prayer does. You're just, you're, you're agreeing with God and his work because you pray long enough for the Holy Spirit begins to pray through you and then God performs the same and life doesn't get any better than that, does it? By Wednesday, I'll ask you what I taught today and none of you will remember. <laughs> On Sunday, I'll ask you what I'm teaching this Wednesday and none of you will remember. I, I accept that. That's why I repeat myself over and over and over again. And some of you will remember, don't, but, but for the most part, most of what I say will evaporate into the air. Oh, but when we pray for one another, hey, we can bear testimony now, right? It, things happen. Life and people change. Wow. Wow. Hmm. Verse 24, but our presentable parts have no need, but God composed the body Giving, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body and that the members should have the same care for one another. I am so, I shouldn't even speak it right now. But I will risk challenging the enemy. I am so thankful for the unity and the peace that we have in the body. For 30 years of ministry, probably for 25 years, there have been division, schisms, drama. Ooh, I hate it, you know. <laughs> but the last few years, it's been so peaceful. No schism in the body, no division. We're all here for one purpose. We want to grow in our understanding of Jesus and his word, and we want to live the same, and we want to encourage each other in that. Isn't that wonderful? And that's the purpose of the gifts, never to divide us. But they divide so many today. For if one suffers, verse 26, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And that's true here, you know. It's, it's true of Americans, they all love success. They just hate people who are successful, right? <laughs> but that, that, that's not among us. We're not envious. We're all rich, rich in faith. Right? And you need to recognize the riches that we have. And part of the riches that we have in faith in Christ Jesus is the riches and the treasures that God gives us in one another. One another. I may not express it as often as I should, but you're, you're a treasure in my life, all of you. All of you that want to come together and gather together and hear the word of God together, this is just a joy. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, even the more so as you see the day approaching. We absolutely need one another. We need the Holy Spirit and the Christ in each other to encourage, to edify, to build up. You understand? And especially as, as difficult times come, there's a, there's a revival in the Ukraine. Revival comes through affliction, through trials, through testing. As the Syrian pastor said, we prayed for decades for revival. Nobody ever thought it was going to come this way through all that suffering. 
And if we experience any of that suffering, you know, you heard of China statement that China made yesterday? No? What did China say relative to Taiwan yesterday? I can't hear you. Any nation that supplies military aid to Taiwan will be dealt with. Act of war. Why do you think they said that yesterday? These are troublous times. These are perilous days, aren't they? I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not a prophet. If the Lord tells me, I'll tell you. But I read his word, and I know it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Right? And as it gets worse, who am I going to need? You. Jesus through you. I'm going to need Jesus in you, and you're going to need Jesus in me. That's the beauty of being in the body. You know, we're not a bunch of strangers. I told my wife, I don't know if I want to speak out again anymore outside of this body. I just, I love speaking to you. You're my family. It's like sitting around the dinner table and me just sharing as a papa. You know, and when I go out somewhere, I just have a lot of strange faces that I don't know. And it's just, it's, I'm out of my comfort zone. But, you know, I just, I just don't feel like I'm empowered in that environment. But here... We all love one another. Here, we'll give one another benefit of the doubt. Here, we understand one another, right? And that's that beauty of assembling together. Anybody ever been in any of those large mega churches? You're a stranger. You're an alien among alien territory, among alien people. You walk in, you walk out. You walk in, you walk out. And you can... I had a cousin who lived with me for over a year, and he was going to a large church here in Greenville. And for over a year, I mean, he, he, didn't, he never heard the gospel. He heard it from me. After he left my house, and he wasn't living with me any longer, he went to the Billy Graham Library, and everything he heard me say, he heard them say, and he ended up giving his life to the Lord. But it wasn't through those motivational speeches that he heard, you know, those uh, practical lessons for living in this life that ever brought him to salvation. And when you get into those huge gatherings, you're just a number, aren't you? Yeah. Does the pastor even know who you are? Does he know your name? No. Hmm. The purpose of the body. If one suffers, we all suffer. One rejoices, we all rejoice. Verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And that's what I like to refer to the church as now. I don't, re I don't refer to Christian dumb any longer, right? We talk about the body of Christ. There's a difference. And you need to make that distinction. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, apostles, right? Now, are there any apostles today? In the general definition of the term, there are, right? We all are. We, we all are called to be disciples first, sitting under our master's teaching, and then we're called to go out, right? To grow and go. As someone said yesterday, grow and go. And we go out to share the teachings of our master, and we become apostolos in the lesser sense. All of us, every one of us. But in the technical definition, the technical sense of an office within the church, can anyone be an apostle today? No. The apostles and the prophets, both of those offices were foundational. They were established for the beginning of the church. What can an apostle do then that you can't possibly do today? I'm sorry, what did you say? Oh, okay, those were requirements for apostleship. You had, you had to be there during the ministry of Jesus and seen the resurrected Christ. Those are requirements. But what can an apostle do then that you can't do today? <coughs> raise, the dead. Raise, raise the dead. Okay, but I'm, I'm not talking about a miracle now. Many of the, who wrote the New Testament? 27 books, who wrote them? The apostles of Christ. The apostles. The apostles could speak and write, thus saith the Lord, the word of God. You can't do that today, neither can I, can we? No. No, we can say, thus saith the Lord, the Lord, thus saith the Bible, but we can't speak forth the word of God the way they do. Now, some claim to be able to. That's that rhema, that's that Pope speaking ex cathedra. Now, that's just not possible. So the office of apostles was given, these gifted men, Ephesians chapter 4, for the foundational development of the church, for that foundation that we rest upon, the foundation of the apostles' doctrine. Acts 2.42, what does it say? They remained steadfast in 
the apostles' doctrine and in prayer and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread. Those are the four legs, four-legged stool, right? It's four-legged stool. Those are the four legs that the church rests upon. The apostles' doctrine, first and foremost, right? The breaking of bread, communion. What does that communion mean? What does it all represent? It's our strengthening. We go out in the wilderness of this world. We get dirty. We need to be cleansed. And communion offers us that opportunity to come and to be cleansed. Now, if you can't make it here on the first Wednesday of every month, because that's when we have communion, you can have communion in your own home. There's nothing that says that you can't have communion. And dad, husbands, you should be leading your families in communion every now and again. Now, in Catholicism, no one has that right except for the priest. Why? Supposedly, he has the power given to him through the cessation of the office of Peter to perform this Eucharistic miracle. Nonsense. It's all this nonsense, right? Apostles, prophets, the third, teachers. Now, in Ephesians 4, it's, it's coupled together. It's a shepherd who teaches, pastor teachers. Pastor teachers is a shepherd who teaches the flock. But in order to teach the flock, you need to be a shepherd. Why is it very important that the teachers you listen to uh, be pastors? It's good that they're pastors as well as just as, as Bible teachers. Why? I'm sorry? Yes, they have a love for the flock. The high priest... What did he have on his chest? <laughs> ephod. What was the ephod? It was the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. He had it right on his chest. Why would he have it on his chest? <laughs> Carry the people in his heart. It was his responsibility to represent the people to God and God to the people. He had to carry the people in his heart. We've seen the damage that some men, some glorified teachers have done who've not been given a shepherd's heart for the flock, for the people. I can remember sitting in a large assembly of pastors and this man was teaching who was not a, not a pastor, but he was a teacher. And he was a very um, revered Bible teacher. This was just before Y2K. Remember that? Come and gone, huh? Like everything else. <laughs> but just before Y2K and, and he was putting such fear into this group of people over what was going to happen. And he said, if I'm an expert in any area, I'm an expert in this area, and the very next day your life will change dramatically. And then he was encouraging them all to buy as many 9 millimeter rounds as they can and store them up for barter. I had to get up and walk out. I'm a hunter. I uh, enjoy shooting. I have several weapons. What is a 9 millimeter round used for? Hog hunting? No, you didn't go hog hunting with your 9 millimeter? No. Deer hunting, it must be used for squirrels. Got it. What's a 9 millimeter used for? Self defense or homicide, killing people, right? And it just went too far. But I have, listen, that's not unusual. Who's the, who's the most revered apologist in the, in the country, if not in the Christian world? Died recently? Ravi Zacharias? Wasn't a pastor. Didn't even have the heart he should for his family, for his wife, to honor his marriage and maintain fidelity. So it's important, you know, that the teachers you listen to, it, it would be wise that they're pastors also because then God has given them that shepherd's heart. And so their teaching is going to be from that understanding of perspective, their love for the flock. Jesus, who is the great shepherd of the flock, right? But he's also the great teacher, isn't he? And he has such love for us. I need to finish up. Are all, <clears throat> okay, let's, uh, prophets, teachers, and after that, miracles, we talked about miracles, and gifts of healing, we talked about that, helps. Oh boy, what a wonderful thing it is. John Michael, God bless you. You have the gift of helps, administration, which is governing or admin, and there's so many in our body who have that, and a variety of tongues. <laughs> but are all apostles? No, not anymore. Are all prophets? No. Okay, but are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Do all have the gifts of healing? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. But earnestly desire the greater, best gifts. And yet I will show you a more excellent way. And we talked about that last week. What way was that? Love. Love. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? And the way is the way of love. Hmm? The truth, the truth of his word. And the life, that life that is eternal, that comes for everyone who has surrendered to him. 
Uh, do you want to continue this study on the gifts and go into Romans 12 next week, or do you want to go back to John? How many want to go back to John? How many want to go to Romans? Okay, that's where we'll go. Shall we stand? <laughs>